constitutes abuse. Have you ever stopped to consider the definition? Is it simply something that hurts another person's feelings? When we do that, are we calling too many behaviors abusive? Thank you so much for joining me today on Breaking Free from Narcissistic Abuse. I'm your host, Dr. Carrie Kerr McAvoy, a mental health specialist with over 20 years of counseling experience and a narcissistic abuse survivor. In today's episode, we're going to take a closer look at the definition, the meaning of abuse, and all of its subtleties. We're going to also discuss why narcissists struggle to hold a job and the differences between the makeup of a narcissistic personality disorder from a narcissistic personality traits. I'm thrilled you're here with me today. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast so you don't miss future episodes and leave me a review. Let me know what you think of the show. And finally, thank you so much for your donation to this listener-supported podcast. Together, we're shedding light on all things related to abuse. So with that said, Let's listen in to the replay of a TikTok Live. I've been thinking about what constitutes dangerousness. Have you ever stopped and actually challenged yourself to define what you consider risky or dangerous relationship, dangerous behavior? You know, I haven't actually done that. I haven't slowed down enough. I mean, it's easy to think of people who put us in harm's way or, um, you know, say that they have undisclosed risks and we don't really know what it is. I'm trying to think of things that would kind of put us at risk. But what shocked me was when I actually came across Sandra Brown's definition of danger. And I realized that I underestimated the extensiveness of dangerous behavior in dangerous people. Isn't it interesting how we are socialized not to be confrontational, not to call out things that, it's like we're, un, we're impolite, we're not hospitable or neighborly. To, to actually challenge somebody on something that's harmful is distasteful. That's how I feel. I, I find it like it's as if it's distasteful. Sandra Brown is an author of several books. One of her earlier works is called How to Spot a Dangerous Man. And she also has a workbook that goes along with it, How to Spot a Dangerous Man. And she defines it in the front of this book, anything, here, let me actually find the spot. She says, I've come to understand the term dangerous to mean anybody who causes damage to their partner's emotional, physical, financial, sexual, or spiritual health. It's not just limited to physical or sexual. We often overlook this truth. And we don't understand beyond the violence that what makes a person's dangerous is the multiple multitude of variety of ways. I was stunned by that. I had never really considered the non-measurable ways that we are in, at danger, like someone risking our financial well-being or someone causing us spiritual confusion or loss of integrity with ourselves or with the world or with the truth. I hadn't really thought about the ways in which maybe it forces us to compromise our priorities, that maybe we are no longer going to have our best future, our best choices, because we've compromised them in order to preserve this relationship. I hadn't considered all the subtleties of things. Here's another thing it just was brought up because I'm getting ready for this webinar of um, called Is Having Sex My Right? It, it was with Lisa Sunny is uh, promoting it, it's hosting it, and we're going to be a panel of us. It includes a pastor, myself, a sexologist. So there's going to be a group of panelists of all of us from various kind of areas with different specialties. They're going to be talking about sexual privilege, sexual entitlement, and then healthy sexuality. What does it actually look like? And I was talking to a friend of mine who it works in the sexual addiction realm of things. She's very big over there. She has men's groups. She works with the betrayed partners. And I asked her for help on the questions because I'm putting together, help putting together the panelist questions. And I was talking about the differences be with her between intimacy and sexual coercion and how does it connect. And one of the things she mentioned was, which I thought was really powerful, is she said, make sure you talk about the difference between performative experience and experiential sexuality. And then she unpacked it. What does she mean by that? She says, when you show up in order to, 
for the pleasure of someone else, but you ignore your own experience, or you fear the threat of the other person's experience because if somehow they're not happy, that it's gonna have ramifications for you and you will emotionally, it will cost you something emotionally. Again, what blows me about way about both of the examples, the, the definition of danger as well as the definition of what is sexual coercion is the subtleties. How often we miss the subtleties of these areas that are that that are emotionally costly and detrimentally affect the relationship. That we like things very clear, very black and white. Uh, I'm thinking of examples of sexual coercion. Well, I never made this person do that. So then how is that my fault? Yes, but you threatened them by saying that you wouldn't, you were going to be surly if you didn't get your way. Well, I didn't actually hit this person. I just sort of said that they had a choice between the job or me. Yes, but now their financial well-being has been compromised because they forced to choose a relationship, whether to stay connected with you versus their own well-being. We don't talk about these subtleties. We don't talk about the subtleties. We talk about the big areas, but we miss the way in which we compromise or minimize or diminish each other uh, in an unhealthy way. And we fail to see that all of this is a form of emotional abuse. Why do narcissists have so much trouble holding a job? Yeah, I've noticed that, that they often end up having a record of lost jobs. Not all of them. Some narcissists do very successfully. I think it kind of depends on the job that they're in. One of the things I've noticed is that they tend to be attracted to powerful positions, positions that give a lot of control, a lot of dominance, things that give them a lot of admiration. There's a lot of, um, you know, credibility to it or a lot of they get a lot of kudos for it. Like, for example, they tend to be attracted to things like medicine, politics, media. They tend to be in the media. They tend to, where there's a lot of like control over things. And, and I think when they're in those area, they tend to do well. But here's the thing that kind of works against them is that there's this internal restlessness and boredom. And if they're not kept on their toes and interested as a result of that, then they end up feeling like they, they lose interest and they also don't think the rules apply to them. So they're more likely to break the policies at work and then get into trouble. You might find them breaching protocols or having inappropriate relationships and maybe even theft of time or theft of resources or, or theft of the project. They just don't see the it applies to them. They feel like they're kind of extra special. So they feel like they get to you know, not have to follow it the way that they want to. I hope that makes sense. And so as a result, they then lose a job or they quit the job or they think the job's beneath them. That's another problem I, I've seen is they get into something, they find it's kind of more mundane. See, the same problem that happens in relationships where there's this fantasy about, oh, this relationship's going to be perfect. I'm going to have it and it's going to be really, really wonderful. And then they get into it and they find out, oh, you know, it's ordinary. You have to go every day and you have to stay even when you don't really want to. And it's really, really boring. All of that happens. And just like they get interested in the relationship with you, they get disinterested in the job and then they, they blow it in some way or they just opt out and they quit. Yes, it's often hard for them to hold jobs, but not always. I wouldn't say that's wouldn't say that I saw that that necessarily meant I met a narcissist because other people have a hard time holding jobs, but I do think that that's not an uncommon thing that happens. My ex-friend and his girl are starting drama at my workplace. Why do they do that? Yeah, have you noticed that? That, that people who have a cluster B personality types, as well as most personality disorders, tend to cause a lot of drama. One of the things that we mistaken is we end up thinking that the best attention is positive attention, right? You don't really want to be called out for what you're doing wrong. You want to be noticed for what you're doing right. You want to hear the compliments and be celebrated. Actually, that's not true. Psychology has proven that when it comes to hierarchy of attention, we would rather have even negative attention than no attention at all. To be invisible, ignored, is a far more uncomfortable experience than having negative attention, which for some of us, I mean, for me, that's not true. I, I would not want negative attention, but there are those that really would prefer just being seen even for causing conflict than to not be seen at all. And that's why they cause drama. 
is that it's gotten boring, they feel entitled, and, and, they, and they like the drama. They like the attention. And here's another reason why arguments are then don't get settled with them. Their goal in an argument isn't necessarily to have closure or to come to some natural resolution. Their goal in, the, in an argument is to actually just create the drama, to stir you up and have it be a problem so then they can walk away feeling happier because now they're not the only miserable persons. They've made you miserable too. So that's, that's a one theory why you might be, they might be seeing this drama happening at the workplace is that it's gotten a little boring. Maybe they, this person feels ignored. Maybe they, they feel like they need to make sure that you all know that they're that special. So, um, the, so they're kind of stirring stuff up. If you've been on social media much, then you've probably heard about sexual or marital coercion. It's when one partner emotionally manipulates the other into being sexually intimate with them. Is this a form of rape? Come listen to a panel of experts discuss this hot topic in an upcoming webinar on October 20th called Isn't Having Sex My Right? I will be joined with a sexologist, a pastor, and other social advocates to explore the connection between sex and intimacy. What is full consent? And how do we improve our intimate connection with others? I can't wait for this webinar. It's going to be the evening of October 20th. Be sure to get your tickets through the show note link below. Let's talk about narcissism. Let's talk about the difference between narcissistic personality disorder versus narcissistic personality traits. I think the best way to think about this is, is think of ego functioning. You have a self. This self has to regulate itself and has to regulate how it navigates the world. How much imagination do you have? Are you able to problem solve very well? How well do you uh, deal with your impulses? Are you able to have good judgment? Are you able to notice when you're having a problem? These are all skill sets that we are born with that are hardwiring and that varies to how good we are in each one. So think of them like metrics that you range on from healthy to weak, or strong to weak. And some of these metrics are really important. It makes us interact healthily with other people. It helps us to see people, recognize them as autonomous people. It also helps us to deal with uncomfortable urges or drives or even just hungers that we may have. We learn how to Moder moderate those, how to regulate them in a healthy way, how to, how to not just act out just because we want it. Freud called this the id. I'm not for sure I agree with all of Freud's theories, but he, was, he talked about how we have instincts that push us and they're, they're innate drives. And one of them is, you know, obviously the drive to eat, the drive to survive. Another drive would be drive to procreate. We have these innate needs, instincts. Are we able, what do we do with them? Are we able to curve them and, or do they control us? So all of these things define what makes a healthy person. Some of them has to do with more narcissistic tendency. Narcissism would be defined as an excessive preoccupation with self to the, to the problematic level of struggling to recognize and appreciate the selfhood of anybody else. So literally, if you were thinking of this as a, let's pretend this is a map. And on this map, you are, you are here. There's you. Can you see other structures, other people on this map? People who are sociopathic or narcissistic or even sometimes borderline personality disorders literally struggle to recognize any other person in the map of their life. They, there's actually like a blindness. All they're preoccupied with is their sense of themselves. Are they coming out ahead? Do they get what they think they deserve? Are they being recognized? Are they getting their needs met? They don't recognize your needs or his needs or your neighbor's needs or the coworker's needs. They don't see these other people. They just see themselves. And then they pursue relentlessly these needs. Now, if we didn't do this at all, if we were a non-self, then our whole function would be, we would be literally uh, like, we would, we would be just an instrument for everybody to use. We would literally not be a self. So we don't want people who don't have a sense of self. You want, you want a well-boundaried, well-defined self. But the other problem is when you can't then also negotiate and recognize the selfhood of other people, then, then you're excessively aware of self. Then you would be ego, what we call egocentric. 
it's all about the self. So you want to balance. You don't want to be a nothing, but you don't want to be the everything. Now, how do we all do with this? Well, we all are on some varying level of varying degrees in our ability to do this. Some of us do it pretty well most of the time. Some of us do it well some of the time. Some of us don't do it well hardly any of the time. So we kind of vary on that. So we all have we all vary on what I would say is narcissistic traits. There comes a point when the trait moves from relatively functional, healthy, reasonable, to where it's pathological, detrimental to others. When we begin to actually step on the toes of other people and we fail to recognize that we're doing it. When our self-motivation is such to where we're willing to manipulate, exploit, and deceive other people in order for us to have an advantage. That's when we start to cross the line. Is when, And it can be subtle, guys. It, it's not necessarily always the big things that we think of. It isn't necessarily like... Um, you know, like I have a secret double life and I don't want you to find out about it. So I'm going to lie and deceive in order to keep you from knowing that. It could be just as subtle as I just failed to, let's go back to sexual coercion. I just failed to appreciate that maybe you're not in the mood that you've had a really rough day. All that matters is that I want my way and I'm going to make life miserable for you and the family if I don't get my way. It could be subtle. It doesn't have to be like the big things. It could be little things. So we all kind of vary on these, on these skill sets. And at some point we cross over. Now, how do you know when you cross over and you've moved from some traits, maybe some, quite a few traits, to where you're pathological? Well, that's where the DSM-5 comes in. It has nine criteria, and five of them need to pop positive. But it's interesting is they all kind of dovetail together. If you look at it, it's like literally picking up a Rubik's Cube, and you're looking at various sides of it. It all still is describing the same, the same crystallized or core problem, which is the recognition and appreciation of other people beyond yourself. So how does it manifest? Well, it manifests by you think you're special, you think you're entitled to unique rules, you're envious when other people get ahead because you think that it's unfair and you deserve it, you're willing to be exploitive in order to get what you need, you don't really care about other people and how it affects them, that's lack of empathy. Um, and I'm, I'm blocking in some of the others how it all manifests, but there's nine ways and you need to have at least five of them. But if you notice... They all are kind of like different ways of looking at the same syndrome, the same issue. Well, how does this happen? Why, why do we have narcissism in the world? They've actually been doing studies on that. They've looked at first the theory was, well, maybe some of us have had really traumatic backgrounds and trauma has caused this. So it, there's actually a, a, a test that you can take called the ACE. It looks at childhood exposure to early trauma. And you can get a score and you can see how you rank or range compared to everybody else, whether or not you've had a, what we consider a very traumatic childhood. They've also considered, well, maybe it's a dysfunctional family. Maybe families cause this as bad parenting, or there's been a big problem in this family, or maybe there's the way that we, the family, you know, attached to each other or took care of the kids. Interestingly enough, they found that that's not actually true, that there is not a strong correlation between Ad, it's called adverse childhood adverse theory. There's not a strong correlation between adverse childhood experiences and narcissism. That there are a lot of people who have adverse childhood experiences that don't become narcissistic. And then there are narcissists who don't have adverse childhood experiences. That there's, there's just not the correlation. So it's been disproven. So then they thought, well, okay, if it's not nature, I'm sorry, nurture, maybe it's nature. So they began to look at twin studies. How likely is, if one twin has it, is the other twin likely to have it? They actually found the rate of, of concordance, the rate that it, one twin having it, if the other twin, first twin has it, is 77%. So if you have an identical twin, your likelihood of having narcissism as well is 77%. So that's pretty strong. To give you a sense of how strong that is, let's take schizophrenia. Schizophrenia, if you have a sibling who has schizophrenia, the likelihood of you having it, I think it's like 12%. Very not likely. Schizophrenia, in fact, schizophrenia occurs in 1% of the population internationally. And I think there's another rate is 6%. So if you have a parent who's schizophrenic, your likelihood of schizophrenia is 6%. So not a strong correlation genetically yet. For personality disorders, they range from the upper 60s to 80%. So high connection. There's a high genetic connection. But there's that range. There's that 23% that don't get it, even when your twin has to, when your twin has it. They think there's some connection between biology and your social life, your early social life, that's causing this, this mental shift 
that actually shows up as damage to the neurological imaging. So they actually are neurodivergent because their brains under neuroimaging looks different than those of a more normal population. So that's how they think that it happens. Now, so you have siblings. So what occurs in the family, it tends to run a family and it occurs in the family. What does it happen to the family when a sibling is, is narcissistic? Well, it would cause a lot of disruption. You would see a lack of responsibility. This person, the sibling, your, your brother or sister would cause a lot of drama. They probably would get in trouble a lot. Or they might be the golden child. You might see this person that they can do no wrong. They're like the perfect image. So I would, I would expect you to either see sort of a black sheep dynamic or you would end up seeing the golden child dynamic. So either they walk on water and they do everything right and their parents are like, oh, look at them. Aren't they so great? Why can't you be more like them? Or I think you're going to experience them as constantly keeping everything stirred up. But I would think there would be a lot of manipulation, a lot of subtle deception. You'd be aware to the degree that they're causing, you know, making mom and dad think one thing when the truth is really something else. I think there'd be a lot of that that's happening that's very problematic. It gets stickier when you get into adulthood because then there becomes increasing leverage. So it wouldn't be uncommon for people to sort of demand holidays go a certain way, to have odd rules around relationships with their children. I mean, I can imagine all sorts of ways that this would have ramifications for once as you get into as you get into adulthood, but it gets really really tricky. Well, that was an interesting episode. I'd love to know what you think. Be sure to leave me a review. So are you somebody who follows me on social media? I'm on Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, Facebook. Maybe you follow other content creators who also discuss narcissistic abuse. Maybe you're a fan of Lee Hammock, Mental Healness, with his podcast, The Narcissist's Code, or Lisa Sunny's Instagram account and TikTok, where she talks about all things related to trauma bonds. Well, nine narcissistic abuse content creators are going to be in Austin, Texas, this Saturday, October 15th. There's going to be a VIP panel discussion where we meet with a, a limited group of participants and take your questions about things related to healing and recovery after abuse. It goes from 1 to 2.30 p.m. And then there's a public meet and greet forum from 3 to 6. Come and meet me in person and connect with other survivors like yourself and be encouraged. I can't wait to see you. So until next Thursday, I'll see you then. Bye-bye.